Hey fairy tale friends, we wanted to come on and give you a quick disclaimer before you start listening to the episode of The Fox and the Hound. We had some issues with sound and so you might hear um, a tick or a metronome uh, sound in the background of some of the audio. Uh, we were unable to get it out completely. Ryan did a fantastic job in editing. Uh, But the content was so good and we had such great energy and we loved our guests so much we didn't want to re-record it. So we hope you enjoy it as much as we did. I'm Tara. I'm Ryan. We love Disney movies. So we decided to watch them all, from Snow White to Frozen 2 and beyond. Each episode we'll watch a different Walt Disney Animated Studios film and tell you all about it. Did we like it? Does it hold up? Who's our favorite hero? Or villain. We'll give you history and fun facts about each movie. And sometimes we'll invite our friends to watch along with us. So put on your tiara. Or your evil crown. And join us on our adventure. This is Tara and Ryan's Princess Diaries. Well, hello listeners. We are back and we have a very special guest today. Someone near and dear to my heart. We do. Uh, Today we are doing 1981's The Fox and the Hound. And because of that, we have brought in... Uh, someone who is a dog lover and a fox herself. Please welcome our friend Gretchen. <laughs> what a wonderful intro! That was so great. I thought it's of it so yesterday, true. and I, I think I wrote it down somewhere. Oh my god, I <laughs> I'm love a it. Dummy. But anyway, hello, Gretchen. Thank you so much for joining us. Hi, thanks for having me. So, what we always ask uh, when people come on, and I realize I didn't prep you for this question, but it's not a hard one, so you're gonna be fine. Um, what, what made you want to do this movie? What do you, what, what is your history with this movie? Why are you excited to, to see it? I love this movie. I loved this movie when I was a kid and I think partially because I've always loved dogs and, you know, dog is main character. And I was, I was just talking about this earlier today. I actually like almost broke my arm when I was playing softball as a kid and I was like, in the ER and I was like oh my gosh I'm gonna name one of my future children Todd because of this movie because I just love this movie so much there's a there's a funny fact with the name Todd uh here in a second but do you want to go ahead and hit us with a synopsis and then we'll yeah, start well, throwing some facts do we want to talk about how we know Gretchen oh I uh, just right? again should, I feel I so comfortable with Gretchen Gretchen's I'm just like, like assume family. everybody oh, knows yeah. yes Gretchen and I met in college and we're uh, BFFs ever since. I honestly, Gretchen, can't like pinpoint the first time we met. Do you remember the first time we met? No. Because I like I don't, don't remember like a specific thing. I just remember knowing you. I just feel but, like I knew you the whole time we were yeah. in school. But... And you were you were transfer because you weren't mm-hmm. there when I was a freshman. Yeah. But Gretchen, yeah, Gretchen and I, um, we're both at the conservatory. We're both in music, <laughs> uh, <laughs> programming. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, at Shenandoah University, but uh, we've lived together in multiple locations and have uh, loved each other ever since. Basically, Gretchen was a bridesmaid at our wedding. Yes, yes, Gretchen was a bridesmaid at the wedding, and Gretchen, Gretchen actually spent I... the last night with Tara as an unmarried woman. I was just gonna say that. Yeah, <laughs> when she I when spent she my last evening unmarried Whoa. with Gretchen when we had the 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 bridal suite, but. <laughs> needed some but we were staying apart so i didn't see you before the wedding mm-hmm. and gretchen was like oh i'll take it <laughs> and we, like, we had like we're having such a fun time and then we got that frantic call from you when you couldn't find your tie that's a story that's for not another a story time for the podcast, <laughs> but yeah it was a frantic night for you but everything went swimmingly on yes, our wedding there was no problem well. um so let's let's get a synopsis yeah, of, the, sure. of the movie A little fox named Todd, and Todd with one D. I just feel like that's a little Mm -hmm. unusual spelling. But a little fox named Todd and Copper, a hound puppy, vow to be best buddies forever. But as Copper grows into a hunting dog, their unlikely friendship faces the ultimate test. And I should say it got a 70% on Rotten Tomatoes. Um, So this was based, this came out in 1981, so we're now officially in the movies that I was alive for. All right, this is the first (laughs) year. Uh, this was based was, off the 1967 novel by Daniel P. Mannix. And I read it was loosely based. So the book is is very dark. And warning, skip forward a few seconds if you're a parent. Uh, and listening with children. And listening with children. Or uh, if you love dogs. Or if you love dogs, yes. yes. Either one. <laughs> it's uh, got skip an old vibe. The, it's got, they're, yes. They're, uh, the, it, it, Copper and Todd hate each other from the beginning. Uh, there's a whole thing about like them like they've 
the they the the forest is destroyed for a human development. Like the book is about how is is nature versus humans and the 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 problem with humans coming in for, uh, and taking over a natural and place. And you mentioned something about the end with copper. The too. end with copper is like copper. I mean, he's an old dog, so that's nice. But like, he takes him out to the woods and like, <sighs> and it's it's and and old yellers him. But um, like, there's this whole thing about how. Copper like kills both of of Todd's mates and all his kids and like Todd dies of old age being like well I guess I'm the last oh one and just goes, like it's like super sad wow. but part of it was is I think they met with the author because the author had a f- pet fox named Todd in real life oh. it's part of the reason named that and um. Apparently it was a very happy guy, and I think he was just writing from like kind of a dark place. And they went, well, "What if we do this with it?" And I think he was like, "Okay." Like apparently after they met with him, they saw his relationship, like and how he spoke fondly of the the fox. And I think the movie's almost more based on that. Well, and I read in um, Frank and Ollie's in the villain book that I have, and I've got specific mm-hmm. facts about that. But I did read in that book as well that they had a similar discussion that they had. With Lady and the Tramp, when um, with the rat, no, the hound. With oh, the different. Hound, oh, with uh, when the hound. What is his name? Oh, people are screaming at us. Laurel specifically is yeah. screaming. I can't think of the hound's name, but the hound gets caught. Trigger? Under, no. No, he gets caught under the wheels of the carriage, and yeah. there's a moment where you think he's died, and they they made the decision not to do that. And a similar thing happened here, where after the fight with the bear. They made that decision that they were like, we don't want one of these main characters to die. Um, so the, they the actively, older dog whose name I can't remember off the top of my head. Yeah, so they actively made a similar decision where they kind of talked it out and they wanted a certain feeling. And so that's why they kind of went the other way, which I'm happy they did. Trusty. Trusty. Got people, sorry for anyone listening who knew that name immediately. I do want to talk a little bit about... Uh, Frank and Ollie, because this was their last movie, yes. and they didn't finish it out. They kind of started working on it and then handed it off. There's a whole Disney thing that called a whole Disney documentary called "Handing the Baton." That's them talking about the new guys. Because who they handed off to and who's working at the studio at this point is is in some ways kind of a who's who. But there's a lot of people who went on to work on Aladdin, Beauty and the Beast, mm. all the uh, Little Mermaid. And uh, Ron Clement is one. Ron Clement, uh, if you're on our Facebook page, is recently uh, uh, Carly, the uh, one of our very you know um, active members on our Facebook group, uh, who did our our new uh, our okay. artwork. So shout out to Carly. Shout out to we Carly. Love it. Um, she uh, recently saw him at an animation. Oh, awesome. It's the one she was talking about. I saw about. her She's... posting she was at an animation conference virtually. So some of the big ones who were, were the new guard of Disney animators were Ron Clement, Randy Cartwright, Glenn, Glenn Keen, John Musker, uh, and then a few you might know, Tara. Do you know – well, Don Bluth, we talked about a bit. Mm-hmm. His actual exodus was in 1979 and pushed this movie back. Well, because he took a lot of people with him. Yeah. I read that in, yeah. the movie was supposed to come out on Christmas Day, and I don't think it was released till July because of he took yeah. a lot of the young animators with him to his studio. And Gretchen, I don't know how familiar you are with Don Bluth, but he's All Dogs Go to Heaven, Land Before Time, mm-hmm. Anastasia... Uh, the Secret of Nim. He's but he'd worked on a films. bunch of Disney stuff and was kind of unhappy with the situation there and went and formed his own studio. And in the next year, in 1982, we'll come out with The Secret of Nim, mm. which I think is one we're going to end up doing. We are, yeah. There was we a the, poll we let on the Facebook vote. page, and I think that's the one everybody wants us to do. Um, so Don Bluth, Brad Bird. You know Brad Bird. I know the name. Director of The Incredibles. Director of Mission Impossible 4. Oh, okay. Um, But he actually got fired from Disney off of this, apparently, because he had a big argument with someone about the bear killing... I forgot the older dog's name in this. Chief. Chief. About killing Chief. Chief voiced the last... uh, Man, I can't remember this actor's name, but it's the last instance of the actor who did The Sheriff of Nottingham. Oh, I'll, I'll find his name. We'll, yeah. we'll, we'll get back to it. Uh, also, John Lasseter. John Lasseter, familiar to either one of you? Yes. Head of head of Pixar? Yes. For a long time. Uh, also, uh, skip forward a few seconds, uh, known sex pest. <laughs> um, and finally, Tim Burton. Okay, so I have a fun little fact about Tim Burton. And now, you know me, I've got to now find it. He was uncredited in this film, it said. He did a lot of the animation for Vixie. Yeah, he did a lot of the character animation for Vixie. And apparently, 
he he grow he grew to enjoy this character, but didn't at first is what I read. Because he has such a gothic style that it originally only gave him the far away shots of her. Yeah. And then he kind of started getting better at uh, the close shots. Four years later, he's directing Pee Wee's Big Adventure, which is kind of crazy, crazy to me. Uh, also, we kind of sometimes go into like, did it win awards? And you mm-hmm. know, I don't know if you want to say the top movies of nineteen eighty one. Let me pull that up again. Yeah. Um, there were it was nominated, but the it didn't win. It wasn't nominated in the Academy Awards scene, but it was for several other awards, and it did win a Golden Screen Award in Germany. So I did think mm. it was fun that it did win something. Top three movies of nineteen eighty one are Raiders of the Lost Ark on Golden Pond and Superman Two is one, two, and three, and our uh, usual 007 watch. Uh, number eight for your eyes only. Wow. For your eyes only. <laughs> do, 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 do. That's a good one. Uh, it's also <laughs> something else we've been tracking that I wanted to mention. I've been tracking all the credits have started at the beginning. This is the last film to do that. Yes, so I have that. So we'll have the credits in the that. beginning. And then Black Cauldron, which comes next, starts to show them at the end. So that's something I've been tracking. I've been curious when that stops. So that's in this film. So what kind of dog is Copper in this? I can't remember. He's, is he a bloodhound of some sort or a basset hound? I think he's like a bloodhound, maybe coonhound mix. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think I, I feel like I read coonhound somewhere. So something like that, yeah. Yeah, because he's got the long, like, bloodhound ears, but he's not quite... He's not low to the ground. That'd be a basset hound, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, and speaking of pets, did you know that Wolfie, our, one of our favorite animators, he had his son's pet fox come in. Did you know that? Yeah, did I think I did that? know that. And I just was like, why... I didn't know a fox was like a common pet. Again, I'm right? saying that's two different people. The direct, the, the I know, writer of the book, yeah. like so two people who had a fox as a pet. So guys, I, I think if you find a fox, do, uh, please give it to a, a local animal <laughs> shelter of some sort. Like yeah. I think you shouldn't right. keep foxes as pets. Yeah, don't do that. Yeah, not not okay. Uh, something to listen out for that we always like to do that if there are things uh, to look for or listen out for. But apparently the bear snarl is the same as Shere Khan in the Jungle Book and the same as Brutus and Nero, the crocodiles from the Rescuers. So I found that interesting. Let's talk a little bit about that bear. Yeah. Uh, Because I don't know that there's a villain in this movie. So, yes. Okay. So I have specific things that come directly from Frank and Ollie in the book. Yes. So I have specific like quotes. Um, about there being no real villains. And Glenn Keane, who you mentioned, who was new at this time, right? Mm-hmm. He was one of the new guard. Mm-hmm. Uh, he wanted an awesome conflict devoid of villainy or personality. So he compared it to the T-Rex and the Stegosaurus in Fantasia, where it was like this kind of big, great fight, but neither one of them were necessarily the villain right. in one way. So that's how he compared it. And they said that the hunter which is someone else you could consider a villain because he tries to kill the fox throughout. Eventually, mm-hmm. you see he's... Yeah. Words in the book, quote for quote, an old curmudgeon, but not a real villain because his true nature comes out after the fox saves him from the bear. So that was like specifically written in the villain book as why they didn't deem him a villain either. I do want us as a group to consider the bear, the villain before, like just as we're watching it and see if we, when we get to this, the other half side of this, if we think he deserves a spot. Yeah, on Yeah. I think list. we still should, even if it's a low on one, it, but um, that's how they felt. They also said here, I just have one more quote that they wanted everyday personalities caught up in conflicts of desires and difficult resolutions than the single minded villains that you'd seen before. Mm-hmm. So even though those are some of our favorite villains that we've seen before, that's what I was mentioning earlier. This movie has a very different um, structure structure when it comes to villain and the protagonist characters and everything kind of wrapped into that. Uh, let's do voice acting because this has got a pretty, pretty interesting cast. And then we'll, you know, we'll, ask a few more questions and get to it. Uh, our old buddy Lampy from Pete's Dragon, Mickey Rooney plays Todd as an adult. Oh, wow. Which is, which he's old. Like when he recorded this, like he's much older than Kurt Russell, who plays the voice of adult copper. Yes. Which this, I believe, Oh, what's the number? I have the number here somewhere. Uh, Oh, here it is. This is the 10th Disney movie that Kurt Russell has acted in at this. Really? But, uh, is the only animated one. Huh? 
Um, because he did a bunch of those live action ones as a kid. Oh, I, I didn't know that. Um, oh yeah, he's the one from The Computer Wears Tennis Shoes, the best movie ever made. I've never seen that. <laughs> um, another thing is Todd is one of the few, I want to say this to see if you guys know, Todd is one of the few main protagonists whose film is a musical but does not sing it at all. Can you, Gretchen, do you think you know who, if you can name the other Disney movies where the protagonist doesn't sing? Yeah, I don't know. So like a main character that doesn't sing? The protagonist, protagonist. Not, the, not a main character. Oh, man. Can you give me a hint? Because uh, like I feel like my mind's drawing the blank. Robin Hood. Robin Hood. Robin Hood doesn't sing. Wow. And also, uh, you can fly, you can fly, you can. Oh, fly. Peter Pan. Peter Pan doesn't sing. sing. And also, when we get oh, to Peter Oliver, <laughs> when we get to Oliver and Company, Oliver does not sing. Oh. But uh, Oliver and Company also, I just saw something the other day. We're gonna have to look up. There's some turmoil because Land Before Time comes out. At the same time as Oliver and Company, which is Don Bluth like competing with Disney, yeah. directly competing. So I'm kind of excited to read up on that, too. Um, a couple other things with the voice. Do you know who Pearl Bailey is? The name sounds familiar. She's got to be a singer. She's, she plays Big Mama in this. Okay. And there's a lot of footage of her, like, very kind of similar to what they did with Peggy Lee, where they videoed her and, and put her a lot into her character. Mm. Um, Jack Alberton, Albertson. Uh, who you may remember as Grandpa Joe is the voice of Amos. Oh, the, from Willy Wonka? From Willy Wonka. Oh, okay. He is the third Oscar winner to appear in a Disney as a voice of a Disney movie. The first two being uh, something Sa- Saunders as Shere Khan and Peter Ustinov as Prince John. Mm. Um, and then real quick, Sandy Duncan is Vixie. Uh, Pat Butram is the character we talk about, Chief. And this is his last role. And then Corey Feldman oh, wow. is Young Copper. Very uh-huh. young. I think he's just very young at this point. Hmm. So, um... Well, Gretchen, do you have any facts or anything that, like, or any... Or just thoughts. It doesn't yeah. have to be a fact. I know. Yeah, it doesn't have to be a fact. It can be a thought. Yeah. I was just curious. Or, kind or of you can make up a fact off. and we'll just tell everyone it was real. Just make it, it was true, yeah. Yeah. No, I read earlier that this was kind of like a comment on racial tensions at yes. the time. And I thought that was very interesting that they would do that by pinning two potential enemies as friends. Mm. Yes. I think there's a in lot. A Disney movie. They, yeah. they brought that up in the documentary. It's a lot about um, when they're young, they don't know that they're not supposed to be friends. And then as they grow yeah. older, they, they, they learn, that. they learn. It's, it's a learned behavior. Um, well, and I think that's a really important thing to make at the start of this. So if you're going to watch it, yeah, if you're gonna watch let's it with keep kids, that in mind. I think it's also a way you could have that conversation, right? Yeah. And refer it to the movie. So it's a really good correlation. Gretchen, when's the last time you saw this, if you can remember? I don't know. When I was a kid. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> It's been a long time, yeah. Well, and Ryan, what, do you have a connection with this or recall this at all? So this is one of the ones that I think was either on Disney all the time or we it might... I, it, I think it was a very early uh, VHS release, so we might have had it for that. It's another one of those ones that I think my mom didn't like, so I didn't really oh. get to watch it much. She was just like, turn that off. I, I really paint my mother in a terrible light. She's a wonderful woman. A delightful woman. Yes. Um, uh, well, for me, I have this vivid memory, and he'll have to confirm or deny it. But uh, my best friend growing up, Jeremy, who will be a future guest on an episode, and I may have mentioned him or just friends I grew up with in general on previous episodes. But I have, like, this vivid memory of us getting it and being at my house and watching it and, like, getting sad and getting upset, like, about it. But I just have, like, this very, like vivid memory of watching it for the first time with him and a lot of these disney movies we watched as the first time as kids because we grew up together but i remember when we watched it feeling like it just came out and so i thought like all this time as an adult i assumed it came out later than it did because i when i watched it i think i thought it came out then right yeah. and it was probably a re-release yeah. mm-hmm. it was probably a re-release when yeah. it came out it came out of the vault or whatever and i think <laughs> i was young enough that i just assumed it was just like coming out for the first time um i just i i don't remember this being fun like i think everything i remember about it is like gosh copper you're my best friend and then like we're not friends anymore and then a bear attacks like that's how i remember it so i i'm trying to remember like the, I mean, those are some of the big like bullet points, i think it, i think you know and that's kind of this more to it, but, but that's the way i felt yeah. about bambi is i thought bambi was just like sad and like making me feel bad about you know taking going out in the woods like you yeah. know like 
which man Gretchen. is the bad guy. And then I thought I feel like this was a lot of that. And I don't. I, I think there's a lot of emotional beats in this one, but I just yeah. don't remember it being super fun. Well, you guys ready to check this one out? Yeah, I think so. All yeah. right, let's uh, pull the uh, VH. Hold up. Let's pull. The- <laughs> <laughs> Let's pull the VHS out of the old clamshell and slam it into the VCR. I get more like violent with the description. <laughs> it's slam it into the VCR. <laughs> Just hit it over the head. Shove yeah. it in. Yep. Mm. All right, listeners, we'll see you on the other side. All right, listeners, and we are back. What'd you guys think? I still love it. <laughs> I, I like for me there were parts I really liked about it. I think it could have been a little bit shorter. I think they could have I, edited it. I some agree with that. Down. There's, there's, I don't think it could have been much shorter, but I think it could have been a little yeah. I think that our reaction is kind of a reaction to this movie has a little more depth, yes. I think, than a lot of Disney movies. Um it's a little you know, it's still a very simple story, but I think it's a simple it's a simplification of kind of you know like like we talked about the the, the prejudicial treatment of people from different backgrounds whether mm-hmm. it's race whether it's whatever and you it's very prominent here and i think like it's deeper than it than, than than other ones yeah and i would i would suggest listeners to look up the lyrics of the whole song when you're the best of friends which plays when they're getting to know each other in the film but there's a couple lines that i think also kind of lend to that as we were talking about like the racial racial tensions are not feeling welcome and that kind of a thing and the lyrics say you know you could clown around forever neither one of you sees your natural boundaries life's one happy game if only the world wouldn't get in your way if only people would just let you play they'd say you're both being fools you're breaking all the rules they can't understand the magic of your wonderland when you're the best of friends. And those are the words that hit me the most. That's like in the middle of the song. But I think there's a lot of power to those words, even though it's kind of over a playful scene. Gretchen, you said you still like this one, but there were definitely some parts during it that I think some people had trouble too. We'll get to that in a little bit, but yeah. But it's also, I think it's the same thing with Pete's Dragon. So um, by this point, oh, listeners. this was infinitely No, no, no. But what I'm, saying, <laughs> what I'm saying is there's also that nostalgia piece, right? This was not a bad movie by any means. But I think also like some of the love for a movie, you still have that with you watching it years later because it brings back certain memories, yeah. right? Yeah. So, and I'm not trying to say like that's why you still love it. You can still love it as an adult for any reason. But I think like we had people coming onto the Facebook page saying how much they love Peach Dragon. We were like, oh, you may want to skip our episode. <laughs> but I think it's I think it's the same thing. Like if you have that nostalgia, I think that does affect. I think it affects our opinions too over the movies that we're connected to. I am, and and we'll get into the actual uh, plot here in a second. I'm shocked that I haven't heard more people talk about how they were traumatized by this movie. It, there are this, some scary parts this, for sure. This came out at a time, you know, we're talking about like Secret of Nim is is pretty dark. Uh, Last Unicorn. There's like these movies around this time that were as was like animation. They, there was a bunch of animated movies around this time that like Watership Down that had very like intense scenes that scared people. And I think the bear scary. I think some of the 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 scenes are are very. I also remember loving Last Unicorn and never being scared by that from oh, my memory. Last when when we're done with Disney movies, Last <laughs> Unicorn's on my list of like we should check out some non Disney movies. Yeah. But like, um, there's a very specific scene that is. Very, like I've seen recently. I'm not I'm like, saying oh, this it's scary. not scary. I'm just saying I don't have memories of it being scary as a child. Right. And this one, I did have a memory of being upset after watching it. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. There are a lot though. of very strong emotional points, I think, in this yeah. film. There well, are also a lot of very cute doggy scenes. What were you going to say? Oh my gosh, so many cute I was going to say, like, I think that the emotional points for me weren't like necessarily scary or like this fearful, but more like that, like, connection with another being and that like that that bond that friendship it's like that's like was the draw for me originally in this i think like that kind of like oh i have a best friend and they're always gonna be there for me and like that kind of like oh warm and fuzzy feeling yeah 
All right, listeners, we're going to dive in here. So what we all found interesting was it starts out very quiet, almost to where you hear nothing. And so you can hear the sounds of nature, the sounds of the forest. Which is unsettling. Yeah, Mm -hmm. it is unsettling. And I wrote here, it's building tension. Like, that's essentially what they're doing, because as the scene unfolds, you eventually start, you start to see the fox running and the dogs barking. But this whole time, this quiet and this stillness, and it's the same thing in Bambi. When it was the mother's, reverse Bambi. Yeah, it was reverse Bambi, but when the mother's like, when everything's very still, mm-hmm. like, it's not a good idea. And the same thing, Vixie says it to him later on in the film, like, it's too quiet. And yeah. so it's interesting that that's how they start it. I think in a lot of ways this movie is a, a kind of a spiritual successor to, to Bambi. I would agree with that, ways. yeah. Um, and so the opening credits, and the, Ryan mentioned this too, this is the first time the film has, like, we, for moment one, we're in the film. Yeah. Because the opening credits for Rescuers shows a scene, but it's not necessarily <laughs> sequential, right? That scene when It's she's... also not animated, which we yes. go into in the last episode. Yeah, which... so you can listen have to you that. Se- have you seen the Rescuers? Yeah. Well, well, do you remember, like... It shows her do something, and then it's still pictures of a bottle floating through the ocean. And oh, I'm like, no. I paid, I paid for an animated picture. <laughs> yeah. But we do talk about yes. that and that. But, um, but yeah, so if we basically see that Todd's mother is running with Todd in her mouth, and she eventually leaves Todd so he'll be safe. And then she runs off into the open space, and then you hear a gunshot. And like Bambi's mom, you don't see her die, but you know that she's no longer with us. And are, that's the first several minutes of the film, if that. Are we, do we show that that was Amos Slade who, who shot her? No, I don't think so. And I don't think we know that it's Chief. I don't think they show the dog yeah, ever. So I guess we just maybe, hear a dog barking. Well, I'm wondering if the implication, because we talk later about like, oh man, is that his mom's I mean, maybe Amos, it was a different hunter. I mean, that's Big Mama's tree, so I guess I mean it could yeah. have been. Um, since they're neighbors. But then that's when Big Mama the Owl comes in and she finds Todd, and then that's when we meet Boomer the Woodpecker, who is voiced by Tigger, or same voice as Tigger, which we yes. were excited about. And Dinky, this little bird that has like this New York, like East Coast accent. Like yeah. it's very thick accent. He looks like if if Archimedes had a sparrow cousin. Oh, I would yeah, yeah. He does look like that a little bit. And I wanted to mention something something about Boomer the Woodpecker. Apparently, I'm gonna just flip back in my notes. Apparently the National Stuttering Project targeted Boomer when the film was released to video. As as a problematic thing they wanted. I think out. so, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Because Boomer stutters throughout, which I don't yeah. stutter, so I can't comment on if it's offensive. I mean, but, yeah, so if, if, I mean, and we've come a long way from that. We now have a president-elect who has a stutter, so yeah. that's good to know. Yeah, so, but that was something that I was, I wrote down mm-hmm. in my notes from the beginning. So Big Mama basically sets out to help Todd. Can I can I bring jump in with one thing real quick because there were supposed yeah. to be two other characters in this movie okay. at this point. Did you hear about the two cranes? No. Uh, they're vo- they're uh, going to be vo- voiced by Phil Harris, oh, our old yeah. friend Ferris, Blue. Blue, Little John, oh. and Charo. What was who's Charo? Isn't Charo the like coochie 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 woman? Does anybody here know what I'm talking about? You're both no. looking. No. <laughs> no. Oh my god. Okay. <laughs> Uh, you guys continue. I will try. Okay. Charo was like a variety show act and she came out and she was uh, a coochie, coochie, coochie buxom, woman. Buxom. And she what was, you just yes, said. It's just, it's just, her <laughs> catchphrases. Coochie, coochie, coochie. Okay. Like okay, she, she's, okay. she's not a coochie, coochie, coochie woman. She's the coochie, coochie, coochie woman. <laughs> oh my God. Um, but that You're was a catchphrase. You're going to have to find us a video. Okay. I will post it. And we'll it. post it to the Facebook page when the episode comes out. Do you out guys need sure. to see it now so you know I'm not an insane person? Yeah, just person? send it to the text thread we have. Okay. We can just even, or just an image of her. I believe you that it's in your brain from something. Hold but... on. Uh, no, we're going to stop. And okay, we're gonna... that's fine. Don't play to. Are you playing this for us or on the recording of the podcast? My name, my passport name is Maria Rosario Pilar Martinez Molina. Oh boy, there's a lot wrong with this. Do you think? Do you think, Charles? Also, my name is Charo, and I'm here to say. 
my god. I told you. Okay. Okay, it's weird, but I'm glad I'm not an insane person. But okay. now I want you to imagine that woman and Phil Harris as, as two characters. characters that in this would actually movie. be really good. Okay, so I'm not sure where you're going to pick up this recording again, but what I will say is, listeners, we've confirmed. Oh, no, it. no, no, that's going in. I that need is. everyone listening <laughs> yeah. to know I'm not insane. All right. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I do think that those two personality types would have been interesting as characters. I will say that, like the the voices. Um, but basically, Big Mama is looking for help from all of from the woodpecker, from Boomer and Dinky. Um, to try to see who can look after Todd. And so they cause a distraction with the laundry to get um, a woman's attention. And I was saying, what is the woman's name? And they never refer to her by name in the film, ever. And Ryan looked it up, and she's called the Widow Tweed. In in my defense, and in the defense of that, it does, it's not the Widow Tweed on I- I- IMDb. It's just, it's Widow, just Tweed. Widow Tweed. It's still also just not as bad. <laughs> it's still just as bad. They don't give her a first name, but we find out when she's milking the cow, the cow's name's Abigail. Abigail has the first <laughs> name. Yeah. Like, there's a lot well, with this. Worry not. Uh, faithful listeners because uh, we know Gretchen and name. Tara have yes, given Gretchen, her a name. Gretchen came up with Eleanor and then said the nickname Ellie and I was like I like that. She looks yeah. like an Ellie. Which is I- ironic. The, it's ironic because the woman who the woman who did the voice, Jeanette Nolan uh, did the voice of Ellie May in The Rescuers. Yes. So, so it job, is guys. It, it was now meant canon. to be. It was now canon. Her name is Ellie, and that's how I will be referring to her in the rest of my notes. <laughs> because I refuse to write down Widow Tweed because it's such a sad and terrible name. Eleanor that, Tweed's a good name. That like, is a good name. Yes, I agree. Name. And Ellie has a nickname. I think yeah. it's solid. But yeah, just like calling her Widow Tweed, no thank you. So yeah, so then... Um, Amos comes along, and I don't know that does she refer to him as Amos at all? Yeah, she does. Amos, a- Amos Slade, like oh, she says yeah. his she does, full yeah. name. Yeah, so he doesn't even know her name, and she's the next door neighbor. I've got a lot to say about him, but <laughs> uh, he comes and Gretchen pointed this out. He comes with copper in a bag. He's in like a, a sack. And that's like how he brings Copper home from wherever he acquired him. We don't really know. From a child uh, he's stolen. Yeah. And then he shows Copper to Chief. And then I love the moment where Copper like nuzzles up on Chief and Chief is grumpy. But then eventually they both fall asleep together. Like there's a lot of really sweet moments like the, that. The Chief-Copper relationship is really that's, good. I, that's yes. a super sweet moment, but that's super unrealistic in dog world. It's like they didn't even sniff each other's butts. What's up with that? Does Lady that ever is... not sniff someone's butt? That's true. Lady does love to Well, none the of these dogs have genitals, so we don't need... <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying, there's a lot okay. going okay. on here. I do have a note that you wanted me to mention the read-along books. You wanted to talk uh, about that so for I, a minute? I recalled you, my memories yeah. is because I have very like strong memories, but just of certain portions of this, and it's because I had one of those read-along books, which I'm, I'd am i love to hear if some of our listeners had those too, where you have the tape and it's like, at the chime, turn the page. Mm, yeah. And it had people's actual, had actual voice and, and sound. I remember from the movie, but like, I think that's why I don't remember big par- portions of this, but I remember like the beats where it's like, we're friends and now we hate each other and there's a bear. Like that's yeah, why that's no, the movie. And that makes sense. It, in a it book had like 14 that pages yeah. with illustrations to convey uh-huh. the plot. Yeah. So then we get to where she's milking Abigail, Abigail the cow. And I've got my notes about, you know, that's when we came up with her name, Ellie. We decided we were not going to call her uh, widow Tweed, but then, uh, Todd is in the barn and is seeing the chickens and it's just out of curiosity, but it's literal fox in the hen house. Like the chickens go yeah. crazy. The cow goes crazy. Um, everybody's like upset. And then there's like this whole subplot throughout the film where we are trying, we see Dinky and Boomer trying to get a caterpillar in the tree and they keep referring to it as a worm. And then eventually they refer to it as a caterpillar. But even when big mama gets them to help to uh, get the, to get Ellie to get Todd. <laughs> I, yeah, I almost said widow and I hate it myself for it. Uh, <laughs> but, but, um, they're trying to get the caterpillar then. So for moment one, like that's kind of their main goal in yes. this film. So we see that throughout. And they had a real Joe Pesci, Daniel Stern vibe to me, uh, where one of them, especially there's a point later where, where Boomer gets electrocuted and his hair looks like when in Home Alone 2. Daniel Stern's, yeah. And, and then 
Dinky, for some reason, has a New York accent. Yeah. Like, we got to get that warm. Yeah. yeah. But I like them, and I'd love to see a movie about them, like, hunting cattle. Like, I, I'd be there for it. Well, we don't know, but there is a sequel to this movie. There is. Uh, Gretchen, have you seen the no, sequel? It came I out haven't. in 2006. No, I didn't. But, yeah, I don't know anything about it. It looks like it It may be, like, a mid-quill, because it looks or like Or do you it's... think it's their kids? Maybe. Think they both. Maybe, but it's definitely, yeah, it's definitely, like... A young fox and hound. Yeah, on the cover. I saw that too, yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, so then Todd chases a butterfly. This is when Todd first goes over to Amos's property. And it's because, again, he's being curious, chases this butterfly. Copper picks up on his scent. And I love this whole back and forth between him and Chief, where Chief's like, don't wander far. And he's like, I can smell my way back. Like, Copper's already so confident in his nose at such a young age, which I think is really sweet. And so they meet up, and I, Copper's first woo 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 is so cute. Corey he, Feldman again. Yeah, because he can yeah. like barely do it, but it's so sweet. And this, all of these scenes are so adorable between the two of them. They're playing hide and seek and Big Mama, um, is seeing them play together. And then that's where we hear the song when you're the best of friends. So that's when that song plays. And then uh, we find out that Copper kind of has to sneak away every time he tries mm-hmm. to play because they don't want him Amos doesn't want him wandering and eventually um which is the most responsible pet ownership moment in this in, <laughs> in the this entire movie, movie. Is, hey, I maybe, would agree with maybe that maybe our puppy shouldn't wander yeah uh so then uh, well and they think he's wandering like he knows how to get home but they don't know that right like yeah. they don't know that he, he's fine at getting back home so they go swimming, they play in the water, and then after that is when Amos starts tying him up because he wanders again, and he's like, I can't have you wandering away. So then there's this whole scene with Todd kind of being curious about Chief, and Chief's asleep, and I should say Chief and Copper both sleep in barrels. So they're yeah. like tied to the barrels, and so Chief's sleeping in his barrel, and he's dreaming, and he does, Lady does this all the time. Are uh, Coda and Bernie strong dreamers like that? Yeah, they do. Yeah. Yeah. They move their paws and like do all that. Yeah, kind of Lady stuff. will look mm-hmm. like she's running and then sometimes she twitches and does her little mm-hmm. high pitch bark, which is really yeah. cute. Yeah, but... those barks. Those yeah. Uh, so that's basically what's happening with Chief. And then Copper's trying to But he's warn... flat out saying like, oh, I got him cornered. Like, yeah, <laughs> and at like... first he says it's a badger. <laughs> oh. And then he goes, and then he sniffs and he smells Todd. And he's like, no, it's a fox. And this whole time, Copper's trying to warn Todd, no, you've got to be careful of his teeth. Like, you've got to watch out. And Todd's pretty naive because he's growing up with Ellie, the sweetest lady in all the land. And so he's, <laughs> he's very much a, like a domesticated cat or dog, like, because he has qualities of both. And so then Chief wakes up, sees Todd, and it's this whole chasing sequence where, like, he's tied to the barrel, but he drags the barrel away and runs after Todd. Um, and then this is where Amos first comes out with his gun to shoot at Todd. A lot of gun play lot of, in this Yeah, movie. so for parents, if that's something you're concerned about, there's a shotgun in Amos's hand pretty much for the majority of the film. And the weird scene where it's like he's in his long underwear and his pants just fall. Fall down? That happens. Yeah, that happens here and it happens a color, a couple other times too. Yeah. It's so where weird. I'm like, out of all those fur pelts, you couldn't make yourself a belt. Right. Of some For kind. Real. Or like, button your pants. His pants are never saying. buttoned. Um, if you haven't picked up on it already, we have decided that Amos is definitely the villain and we can go into more why when we get there, but... Uh, so then Ellie goes into the town with her car. I'm assuming to sell her milk. Like I'm assuming yes. that's what she's doing. And she's got all the milk canisters in the back. Doing and pretty well. Pretty good yield for one cow. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I would say so. Yeah. And so the chase with Chief and Todd is going on this whole time. So Todd's trying to catch up with Ellie. Amos then follows in his car with a gun. Just following aiming Chief. at the back of a car. Yeah, like no big deal. shooting at the car and he shoots the milk canisters. So there goes all of the money she was going to make for yeah. probably the month or more. And then... I love, this is when we first see her being really independent, but I love that she stops the car short to make him stop. And then he, she takes his gun and shoots his radiator in his car. And that's when I knew that she was my soul sister. And I love her. <laughs> and because then he says, blasted female and muddle-headed female. The term female is used 
many times in this movie as a derogatory. Yes, and Gretchen very much was like, female is an insult, like, as we were watching yeah. it. And it's very true. The way it's used, the tone in yeah. which they say female. And the other thing I wrote here, too, she never insults him. So when he's huffy and puffy at her and angry at her, she's angry back at him. She never says an unkind word about him. So it's just another teachable moment. Uh, So, yeah. So then uh, he threatens that the next time he won't miss and he'll hit Todd is basically what he threatens before he leaves. And Which so, is incorrect. He shoots at Todd many more he times. He does shoot at Todd many more times and does miss. He is. He's not a good shot. It's. it's Considering when he comes back from the hunting trip, the amount of animals he has killed, he has to have fired off 5,000 So shots. many rounds. Like, of, yeah. yeah. With one shotgun. Yeah. Yes. So uh, she then keeps Todd in the house and Todd's really upset and she sees that Amos is going hunting and that he won't be back till next spring. So Todd sneaks out um, through the window because he wants to say goodbye to Copper. And this is when Big Mama starts, I wrote, schooling Todd in education or elimination and kind of letting him know, you know, Copper's going on this hunt. He's not going to come back as the same dog when he comes back. And so she sings this song. um, And she she says another phrase here in the song that I wrote down, you'll wind up hanging on the wall, which I thought was kind of an intense Well, because they open up his shed. Yeah, they open up his shed. And and that's what you guys said. Is is the mom. Are they showing Copper his dead mother's. Not Copper, uh, uh, Todd. Todd. They're showing Todd his dead mother's skin. Yeah. Which Which I know. I took it there. I'm sorry. But uh, but training a hunting dog a real killer. So those are words that Big Mama uses. So then the movie shows fall and then into winter. And then we see the caterpillar shivering. And then Boomer and Dinky are cold. And then the caterpillar gets warm by the fire. And it reminded me of Jiminy Cricket. Because Jiminy Cricket does a similar thing in the beginning of Pinocchio. Where it's cold outside and he goes in to get warm. Uh, so it just like made me think of that scene. Well, there's there's a funny bit later where she puts the plant out after winter and then is like, oh, I can't believe it died. And it's clear that the <laughs> caterpillar, the, the caterpillar ate, ate yeah, most like, of the leaves. Yeah, ate the leaves. And then she kind of like fills it with water and he's kind of swimming around yeah. and drowning in it. I just it, thought but... that was funny. She's like, huh, I wonder what happened. And yeah. He's like, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but then the, the birds say they're going to fly south for the winter. Big Mama stays put, but Boomer and Dinky leave. Big, Big Mama's got some padding. She's going to be fine during the winter. Yeah, yeah. She's a, she's a big, big sexy owl. <laughs> she also never sleeps either. Like, she's one yeah, of Yeah, we, right. we were I, trying to decide that. And then I was curious if owls hibernate, which I don't know that they do. But I will do a quick She Google comes search. out of, like, her tree... With all these leaves, and that made me think, do owls hibernate? But Ryan's going to try to see what he can find. But then um, we go and we see Copper. So we see him still young, in the snow, on the hunt. And most, Cop- most owls hibernate. Oh, okay. Morning. All right. Well, then that did make sense, the way they oh, showed up. Okay, yeah. This article starts out, hoot, hoot! <laughs> <laughs> hoot. Sorry. That's great. Uh... That was worth it, just for you to look yeah, at the title it was. article. So then we see Copper trying to chase a rabbit, and he slips on the ice, and Chief's kind of rolling his eyes. Like, Chief's feeling really big. And when they leave to go on the hunt, Chief's in the front seat, and he says, you have to earn it to be in the front seat. And Copper's happy to be in the back of the... He doesn't really seem to mind, but that comes into play a little bit later. But then we get back to the cabin and we see all those furs. So we that's the first time we see all the furs that Amos has caught. Mm-hmm. And then um, then this is when Copper shows up chief with his nose when he gets the birds. So he goes to the birds yeah, and yeah. barks at the birds. And then that's when on the way back. Like quail in a bush. Yeah. yeah. Then Copper is sitting in the front. So when it's springtime, Copper's now in the front. Chief's in the back and is sulking. And so as we see spring, we then see Todd full grown as well. The birds are back and we now see that Todd has a collar. So he's like 100% domesticated now. Has a collar, is like a dog or a cat. So then that's when we see Ellie putting the dead plant out, what we were referring to earlier. And then Amos is singing on his way back. So this is like the only time we see him cheery. He's kind of (laughs) sing-songy on the way back. And this is when Chief is pouting because now Chief's in the back and copper's trying to play with chief and he's not really having any of it when they get back like he's trying to wrestle with them todd sees copper at night and you're still my friend so todd's 
thinking they're still friends and is kind of whispering and wanted to see him and wanted to say hi. And Copper says, no, I'm a hunting dog. So Copper kind of at this point is like, we can't be friends because I hunt you. And so um, then this is where the night chase happens. Where is it Chief that wakes up? Yeah, yeah. Chief, I think so. And Chief I think so. And then Chief, up, and they all and start then chasing Amos him. wakes up and starts running after him again with the gun. And they yeah. f- they find him, and Copper is basically like, "I'll let you go. I'll this let one you go time. this time." But that's yeah. it. So he leads Amos off, but then Todd tries to run away on a railroad track, and, and Chief, Chief picks finds up the him. scent. Yeah, yeah. So Chief runs out to the railroad tracks. There's a train on it, and it's the railroad tracks where it's like over water high up. Uh, it's, similar it's to Aristocats. Yeah, or Aristocats, I feel yeah. like. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's... O'Malley falls into the water off high train tracks right. like that. So um, that's essentially what happens. <laughs> I just remember those two geese. Those, those stupid two... geese. <laughs> um, but yeah, so Chief gets hit by the train and falls into the water and the rocks below. And so there is that moment. We were talking about it earlier about how you're not really sure if Chief is going to make it or not. Right. In that moment. Yeah. I, I feel like there was just minor adjustments to the script for him not dying because there were scenes that they didn't have to change at all because, mm. you know, the emotional inflection was the same. Yeah. Copper finds Chief at that point and is and looks up angry and sees, at Todd. Yeah, yeah. sees Todd and, yeah. and swears revenge to the night, which was like, oh, okay, that's dark. Yeah, it kind of takes yeah. a turn there. And then Ellie's out all night looking for Todd. So she had heard the gunshots and the commotion. So she's out looking for Todd. She finds Todd. And then in the middle of the night, Amos comes stomping out of his house angry. And again, we don't see Chief at this point. But he comes stomping out of the house angry and goes to Ellie's and confronts her. Tries to barge in. But I like that she closes the door. She locks the door. Um, she says you can't come barging onto my property in the middle of the night. Yeah, and so I like, again, that she's being independent and she's like, no, you cannot come in. Well, you made a good point that this felt very much like... I had really hard time in 101 Dalmatians when Jasper and Horace break Barge in. Barge in with the nanny. With the nanny, yeah. and there's a home break in. And this... this It felt like this could have went there and it didn't. And it I didn't. appreciate that it didn't go but there. But once you said it, I went, oh yeah, these vibes are like... It was a up. similar feeling. I don't know, yeah. I, just don't, I just don't like seeing... I mean, I think uh, Nana and 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 uh, the widow Tweed had very Ellie. had very uh, <laughs> similar vibes. So I think that was yes, I would agree with that as well. Yeah, so yeah. so then um, she takes Todd and she's crying and she puts him in the car and driving away sad and she has like this inner dialogue. But it's a poem. Yeah, it is very <laughs> much a poem because everything rhymes and. Todd's oblivious. He like just thinks he's going for a ride like a happy dog. Like Which makes it even more car. sad. Yes, so sad because he's completely oblivious. She knows Todd understands her. Like, tell him, give him a heads up. Like, she doesn't. Does she know he understands her like I that? I mean, she talks to him like, come here, go there. Like, I talk to Lady all the time and I know half the stuff. I say she doesn't understand, but I still tell her. Don't look at me like that. Gretchen does the same thing with her dogs. Yeah. I mean, she knows he that he can't speak English, but she still speaks English. Too. Yeah. But if like, I were to turn to Lady right now and be like, "Lady, I know you've been having trouble with the the uh, <laughs> uh, platypus next door, so we're gonna have to take I, you I, out." I, to I the... wouldn't say that, but I might say, "I'm really sorry, but I have to take you. You can't live with me anymore." I don't know. Say something, but she says nothing. It is weird, and it's like she the has only like an inner, inner dialogue, dialogue in but she's movie. not actually speaking. Well, in an animated yeah. movie, if you have inner dialogue, that means you're not animating a mouth. Yeah. So. I guess, yeah, good point. So she takes him to the forest, and again, I write here, Todd has no idea, and she drops him off in the woods and takes off his collar, and that's when I was like, she's trained him to be, and then Gretchen got the word for me, but domesticated. Like, he's he's... as domesticated as possible, and then that's when Ryan said, this movie has a lot of irresponsible pet ownership (laughs) moments, and he's not wrong. But then it's raining and it's cold and this is reminiscent of Bambi and of Bongo. Bongo, yeah, the bear. Um, and he's seeing creatures and for a moment we see the sword in the stone squirrel, which was exciting. It looked oh, yeah, identical flat to out. that squirrel. Because yeah, yeah, yeah. um, then it, when it lands, it's a different animation, but the stuff before that is yeah. copied, yeah. Uh, but he's trying to find shelter and he runs into, is that a badger? Yeah. Digger is what the porcupine a, refers to him as. A badger but, or a wolverine yeah. or something. But he kind of like runs into him and he's grumpy and like you can't stay here. And then finally the porcupine who is Piglet's voice. Mm-hmm. It's kind of fun that Piglet and Tigger were both in this. Uh, invites him. He can stay in the tree with him. 
So then we see Chief with the busted leg by the fire. And I love this bit where he is calling out in pain for attention. It's obvious he's uncomfortable, yeah. but he's really just trying to get attention. And then he's like, oh, they won't even come and see how I'm doing. The uh, Badger was voiced by John McIntyre, who also was Rufus the Cat from sound- The Rescuers. Okay, his voice sounded familiar, but I wasn't able to pinpoint it. Um so then this is when Amos shows Copper the trap, like the bear traps, the kind of metal closing traps, and that that's how they're going to get Todd. And Big Mama at this point... Don't, I'm sorry, those can't possibly be legal anymore, right? Oh, they're I not. I would hope yeah, not. No, they're not. Okay. I was about to say, they feel like an old well, cartoon so uh, weapon. Inhumane, like, too. Well, it just feels antiquated. Like, it, it, like, there's no such thing as those bombs that are just round bombs with a fuse. Yeah, but like I think some a trap like these existed. No, yeah. I know they existed. I've seen them before. But what I'm saying is it's like, whereas those bombs that are around existed just not before a certain time period. I see what, I see what you're just saying. It's just the only yeah. person who I feel like uses them are like Boris and Natasha and Wiley Coyote. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. So he shows them the trap. Big Mama starts looking for Todd and she finds Vixie first. And so she starts... Talking about Todd and then realizes that she could be like a matchmaker. And yeah, it's kind of like, a funny realization that she makes in the middle of talking the, the to The animation there is really cool because she's yeah. like, I have to find Todd. He's a fox about your age. Like, and he's yeah. like, handsome. Yeah. 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 Uh, and, then this, and then Digger being grumpy again. So uh, Todd falls out of the tree, is very startled and kind of like unsure where he's at. Falls into Digger's hole, essentially. And says, why don't you go back where you came from? Which was a really harsh comment in that moment yeah which i also also think could play into what we were talking about earlier with racial tension right um and so when big mama finds todd she kind of sets it up so she shows him vixie like kind of presents he's she's like you stay right here to vixie and then when she goes over to todd they turn and they look and it's like this hero moment with like a yeah a soft light and the light and you said the maid marion look yeah she gives him that kind of like straight Mm -hmm. on Made Marion look. And then there's this whole scene where Vixie asks this Todd if he can catch a trout. And of course, he's trying to show off and says he can catch a trout. And we, the viewers, know he's never caught a trout oh, in his life. If you don't know, if you don't put that together, Big Mom is like, oh, God. She's like, like she's don't like, overdo oh, it. Yeah. <laughs> don't overdo it. please. And then she says, please make him catch a fish. Yeah. Like, yeah. I love that comment. <laughs> And then everyone starts laughing because obviously he can't catch the fish. And then he's his ego's bruised. And this is kind of that Bambi thing with being Twitter it and then like trying to like puff out your feathers, right? Like mm-hmm, trying mm-hmm. to, and then he gets like hurt and his ego bruised. And then he calls her a silly, empty headed female. And that's again. Where we get the insult of female again. The way again. he, yeah, the way he says female too. I, look, I, 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 I didn't write it. I don't. Yeah, I know we're yelling at Ryan Ryan. through the whole movie. Some man wrote it. Yeah, Uh, but Big Mama. That's when she starts talking about natural attraction. So she starts talking about that a little bit, and they wind up making up, and they explore the forest together, and it ends on them snuggling by a waterfall, similar to uh, Lion King, and what's the one we saw? Aristocats. Well, we also talk about how Boomer and Dinky are like. Oh, it's just getting good, and they're like watching them like cuddle up, and I'm <laughs> yeah. like, "That's weird." Yeah. And it was like Timon and Pumbaa like creeping From the side, on, yeah. on Nala and Simba. So then the next scene we see is Amos, and he comes across a hunting sign and a fence, and that's in the forest where Todd is, and he clips the barbed wire and says, "We're not hunting, are we, Copper? We're Man. just going after a fox." Yeah. Uh, and so Copper starts tracking. And so this is where it starts to get darker again, too, because they start setting up the traps. And you count it, what was it, five? It was at least five at one spot. Like, within, like, from one end of this tiny room. Not t- it's not a tiny room, but it's like a bedroom, a bedroom, normal, like, kid's bedroom size yeah. room. Yeah. And there's, like, five traps. Like, yeah. yeah, it was a lot ridiculous. of traps. So, you know what I could have done was actually give an actual measurement, like a human being, <laughs> which is universal instead of trying to like vaguely. Like a kid's bedroom, a normal a, size what a room. What a dingbat. Uh, all right. Uh, but, but wait, so all we, the tra- can we just say that this is like 
another this is another moment where Amos is showing his true potential to be a villain. Yes, where he agreed. breaks into this gaming area and yeah. Oh, stop drilling! You've hit oil, Gretchen. Yeah, we all agree. Amos disagrees. No, yeah, I'm we, just saying it, there it, might it, be people who are disbelievers. Yes, but just I. Need to, there, Make it he but does just need have, to be quiet about it. Yes. Yeah, we'll get to the 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 one the one mark in the pro column, which, which is, is an, very I don't light. even think a pro a mark. It's in not the pro even column. that he has yeah. a dog. That's his well, pro and listeners, mark. I usually tell you not to be quiet on your opinions, but I will find it hard to believe if anybody is rooting for Amos here <laughs> watching this film. I wasn't rooting for Amos. I think I liked him better than you guys did. I liked the curmudgeon aspect of him, but it gets to a certain point in the movie where I think he has a lot of go-away heat and I don't care well, for him okay. anymore. When I I'll say, say I like him, and we'll go into this later, I don't mean I want to hang out with Amos anytime uh-huh. soon, yeah. but I think he's an effective heel and he's actually okay. yeah, an enjoyable Okay, yeah, I would agree with that because I, I didn't care for him, so that part makes of it, him effective. Part of what probably made him more effective to me was watching the two of you be like, all right. Like, <laughs> like, <laughs> uh, we, we did get uppity about... If you haven't, if you haven't been able to tell, I think Uppity is diminishing of your opinion of him, which is perfectly justified. True, it's just true. He's not a real person. <laughs> like so, to me, I was a little more tempered. Fair and you guys enough. are just like, what did he say? Hold me back. Like take it off your earrings. Like, <laughs> very true. Uh, so uh, going back to the traps, <laughs> we see Bixie. This is where we mention. We mentioned earlier where Vixie, again, smart woman, is like, it's too quiet. We do not want to be here. I'm the one who's lived in a forest my whole life, Todd. Maybe you should listen to me. She doesn't say that, but that's really what should have been said there. There's a lot of women dealing with ding-dong men in this movie. Yes. And she says, you don't want to go in there. And she tells him to be careful. And he is being, he's not being careful. She should have been like, remember when you tried to catch trout? Yeah, is it the same thing? (laughs) Same thing. But more dangerous than that. Um, so he kind of like tiptoes into the leaves and we saw earlier that Amos covers the traps. Is it Amos or Amos? Amos. Amos. I think I keep saying Amos. Um, (laughs) but he covers the traps with leaves. So it's, again, it's a high tension moment. Like the music changes and you do feel very anxious for Todd as he's walking because you can kind of see one of the traps that he steps over and he hears the shotgun, like the cock of the shotgun, right? Yes. That would, that's how you say that. Because you cock a shotgun, and that's the verb, but I don't know but if there's the sound. a noun. Yeah, whatever the sound, the sound yeah. is that it makes when you cock the a cocking? shotgun. Yeah. Cocking of the shotgun. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> By <okay>. John Steinbeck. <laughs> <laughs> Listeners who are hunters, tell us, because yeah. the three of us are not. <laughs> it's, it's shocking that we're from Texas. <laughs> the three who also, like, were so appalled by all the pelts in the shed are not the hunters. <laughs> yeah. But you know was, I've skinned something before. I did not know that. We had so we were talking. I'm, about I mean, this. I'm fine with that. We, I just didn't know that. I made a comment that Gretchen laughed at. I kind of need her to know it was a real comment when I said I was in. I did mountain man classes in winter camp for Boy Scouts. They had a group who would for every week they'd go up and they lived and they lived in pelts and they lived in teepees and they or like all year round. No, just during the winter oh. camp. So the winter camp would run a couple weeks and like we'd and go for a week. And you would go up for the week with the people who were living up there? Well, okay. So the, it's like you go to this camp and you just camp like a normal Boy Scout camp and there's you do merit badges and stuff. But okay. there's also mountain men classes. And that's a group of scouts of like older scouts who are working the camp. And the camp runs a few weeks, but different troops come in. Got it. And we, you would go up there and take some mountain men classes. And I thought the mountain men classes were super cool, but they I didn't. Mean, they didn't I could account- have told you that. Right, but they didn't yeah. account to any. So it was like black powder rifle. There was like a tomahawk throw in one. But it was one. like you couldn't earn badges. There's no merit for badges stuff, for yeah. that. Um, and one of them was trapping. So I took the trapping course, and he just kind of runs you through like this is mostly what traps are are you step in something that just grabs your foot. Like, it's not... Like, it doesn't, like, like claw Because I think he said those, like, you know, especially if you use the bear trap on a fox, this is probably going to be... Skip forward a little bit if you got kids in the room. That's going to take off a fox's leg. Yeah. That's not going to catch a fox. Yeah. Like, but... Um, and then one of the things we had to do is we watched him and we helped skin some rabbits. Hmm. Yeah. Also, question, where was this in Texas? Um... 
Was it so, like Amar? Was it like North? Yeah, but when I say winter camp, like you're thinking snow. There was no. Snow, I am. Just yes, cold. I'm thinking oh, okay. like fur trapper snow, that kind of thing, and I'm like, huh. Uh, I mean, maybe there was a little because it was in some place where there's a big hill and they were near the top of the hill, but yeah. it was like well, more like frost. Well, I know frost. Amarillo gets snow sometimes. A- again, a light dusting or frost or yeah. iced. It was stuff like that. So got it. Well, interesting. Was that a good diversion that felt very long? But I just wanted you guys no. to know that I'm a manly man, Looks and nice. I wish you'd appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> um, as he's like going through, he hears back to the shotgun, us trying to figure out the, the name for that sound. That's what he hears. And he runs and then all the traps snap, but he, Todd doesn't get caught in them. So he runs away with Vixie. And I like that when Copper catches up with Todd, Todd doesn't keep running. He stops and shows his teeth. It's kind of a standoff for a few moments between them. And I do like that Todd's kind of standing up for himself in that moment and protecting Vixie. Well, I think it's also to show that they're like, this is not a joke. They are enemies in this moment. Yeah. And it's not just Todd being like, Copper, why? It's like Copper's like, no, man. Yeah. You're right. We're not on the same side right now. I don't know if you guys noticed, but his eyes actually turn red when he is in that standoff moment. Oh, Oh, I did notice notice that. that. Good Good catch there. Um, so then they run into the burrow. So he tells Vixie to go ahead to the burrow. Then Todd ends up in the burrow and Copper gets pretty far into it. So they try to go out the other side and then Amos, Amos is there, shoots the gun and then lights starts a forest fire. <laughs> lights, dry brush. <laughs> Another and shoves strike it against in there. him. Another strike against him. Literally starts the forest fire. And then that's when Ryan made a joke about the park ranger going to be the big There's gonna be. I wanted a park <laughs> ranger to like what saves... Todd, as a park ranger, appears behind Amos and, like, pistol whips him. And then <laughs> finds him for, like, trespassing and among other things that like he does. Like, some real, like, Patrick War, like, like Mr. Incredible, like, big shoulders yes. down to a... Yeah. 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 So then, um, they get across past this waterfall on a log, and Copper is picking up a scent, and it stops, and he's smelling something behind these, like, shrubs... And that's when the bear comes out of the bushes. And this is where I think it gets the scariest um, and just most intense because there's a lot of flashes and back and forth. Uh, But Amos is caught in the trap. So his foot winds up getting caught in one of his own traps, which serves him right for laying those traps. (laughs) Just saying. I don't. Was that supposed to be one of his traps, or just another trap that was? I there? guess yeah. I guess maybe it could have that's just a, been another trap. Yeah, I'm but, nitpicking, but still, yeah, it's, that's it's, fine. But it kind of is showing like you got caught in yeah. your own trap, kind of a thing. And then Copper starts attacking the bear to defend uh, Amos since he's wounded at this point. Do we he, consider the bear a villain, or is the bear just like an event? I was thinking that the bear feels more like an event, and the bear also feels like you're in my. Yes. Home. Yeah. Like yes. I'm defending my home. Like you came into my home. And to be honest, that's why the signs are probably up. Like they're not supposed to be hunting there because of the type of wildlife that's there. Right. Yeah. So that's kind of how I yeah. felt with the, the Amos bear. is a good enough bad guy. We can. Yeah. I mean, do you feel that the bear is a villain? I think the bear was going to be the villain when I, if we weren't going to call Amos, but I think. I agree. (laughs) Yes, I agree. And I also think when I read that comment at the beginning out of the Frank and Ollie book, they, they worded it, they painted Amos in a way more positive light than I ever see him in this entire film. I disagree with that statement, even though I love that book. I Mm. I don't agree with them on that. Do you think that some of that has changed because of the way that like we view society has changed. Like we know for us, like lighting forest fires like that is not a cool thing. And misogyny is not cool. And that's a good point. I, and it was uh, written by two men, the book, right. you know, when they're reflecting back on these ago. animated characters. I yeah. think they wanted his redemption to be a bigger, stronger impact than it actually was. Yeah. Yeah. Like I think they and meant we're, for him we're to feel villainous, in the next but couple I did minutes, make, I, yeah. yeah. About his redemption. But essentially, um, Amos can't get to his gun, and Todd hears Copper yelp, so he goes back. So Todd, in my mind, is... Is the hero of this yes, picture. Todd yeah. is the hero Todd. of this picture. Todd always does things for the benefit of others and has this, like, naive curiosity that I really like a lot. Like, there's so many good things about Todd. And he goes back when he really doesn't have to, and he goes after the bear, and he attacks the bear, and he knocks around 
um, and kind of spins the bear around, and then he gets out on that log again over the waterfall. And then and- the bear comes out and swats the log in half. Like, the bear becomes the <laughs> dumbest bear. Yeah, and then they I both... have no sympathy for that bear. Yeah, and then they both fall into the water. Again, if the bear was considered a villain, it's another villain falling from a high height. Yes. We have a lot of that so far. But um, they both fall in the water, and then Todd survives and is pretty wounded and just... Pretty much just like out of breath and like he's, he's, defeated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, in the water, and Copper comes after him, and Copper I think was checking on him, and then Amos shows up, and then I wrote redemption question mark question mark, and then I wrote like a slash through it, like no, that doesn't happen <laughs> because Copper winds up standing in the way. Amos gets his gun and is going to shoot Todd. Copper stands in the way, and Copper's the one who changes Amos's mind about shooting Todd. But there's nothing in the film that tells me that Amos feels Todd saved them from the bear. Amos killed eight more animals that next week. No question. And also, he was shooting at squirrels from his porch with his broken leg. Yes. There's no question. <laughs> also, also, there's nothing that shows me that he thinks Todd saved his life. Because yeah. I think he just he didn't feels, want to shoot copper. He's like, wanna, I give up. Yeah, and he's in yeah. pain with his leg, and he's like, let's just go home. If anything, Copper was redeemed in that moment. Yes, yeah, absolutely. I would agree with that. I would 100% agree with that, that Copper redeems himself there. Because at the end, when they look at each other, they do smile. Yeah, there's yeah. a, there's a, a, a Which respect. Which I appreciate. I think they're both reminiscing about, I think they realize, like, we can't be friends, any, we can't be together anymore, but yeah. we'll always have our memories. Because that's, at the end of the movie, it's Copper thinking about them when they were kids. Yeah, and yeah. I think also Copper being thankful that Todd did come to his rescue. Yeah. And, and then Todd getting that acknowledgement, like, you see me, I was here for you, like, I stood up for you in that moment. And I think there's something to be said about that. Yeah. Um. As well. And so they both go their separate ways, and then we go back to Big Mama in the Tree, and Boomer and Dingy? Dinky. Dinky. Because he's little. Thank you. Boomer and Dinky come back and they're going after the caterpillar again. And I was waiting for it the whole film. But all of a sudden, the magical colors and the caterpillar becomes a butterfly. So I just liked that. <laughs> and Boomer's like, there's something about those eyes. And it's like, yeah. a, he's a different color. Yeah, he's a blue butterfly. A, like yeah. a blue and pink butterfly. But he's but then, also like glowing, which I like because he got electrocuted and was a glow worm. Oh, there. yeah. That's oh, right. I forgot he was, about I didn't, that. Yeah, yeah. We didn't mention that scene. But yeah, you mentioned it with the hair for mm. Boomer. Yeah. Um, but then Ellie, we see that Ellie winds up taking care of Amos. What? Like, he's been Why? so grumpy. Because I think oh. what they're trying to say is it's important for every woman to take care of a man. And yeah. Uh. And, if you've, and she's lost one, which means she is without purpose. It's the so worst. really what Amos is doing here is giving her a purpose, a purpose in life. In and life. she should be thankful yeah. for... It's the <laughs> absolute worst. He can't even call her by her actual name, which we never find out what it is. It's, it's the worst. It's Ellie, yes. Yeah, it is Ellie. <laughs> I would have, like, died if at the end he said, thanks, Ellie. You guys, <laughs> would, it would have been, like... I lost my mind. <laughs> like, like, rap air horns would have gone off. You guys would have been standing Fireworks, up, like... Fireworks, dude, and, like... <laughs> we were like, you're redeemed, Amos, you're oh, redeemed. Uh, but we do... We see Chief and Copper at the end, and they fall asleep, and they're, you know, in their barrels, their routine... And then we see both Vixie and Todd looking out over them at the end, yep. like from afar. And that's the end of the film. It says the end and it it goes goes to black, basically. And we never know if they have six pups or not. We don't know. Do we does... mention that, that she says no, she wanted we six pups? We didn't mention that, but yeah, she does say she thinks six would be enough when I think it's the quail. It's like some sort of bird uh, yeah. with little baby birds goes by them. I was going to say, I read before we got on here that that was actually a nod to Robin Hood. Because in Robin Hood, she says that. Marion says that. Oh, oh, that's right. They're like, they're counting. He's he's saying how many babies they should have. And she's yeah. like, six? Oh. oh, that's so fun. All right. So we, we have questions we tend to ask. Um, and we'll go through them right now. Uh, so first question is, with this being Taryn Ryan's Princess Diaries, how was the princess? We don't have a princess in this case, so I'm going to go with Todd and uh, Copper as the princess, as the protagonist of the movie. Yeah, I would think so. I 
well, thought I was going to like Copper a lot. And Copper has some adorable moments as a kid. They don't really do much with him as when he's Kurt Russell. They don't like give him like a beautiful deve- mullet. Yeah, and they don't, or, de- uh, they don't like develop. That. I feel like they don't develop his character as much as they do Todd's. I feel like yeah. Todd has much more personality. And Copper, and maybe that was purposeful. Copper kind of becomes less of a personality when he's an adult because he's now just groomed to hunt so I don't know if they meant to do that intentionally but I feel like I distance myself from Copper more as he grows up also because I feel for Todd I think is part of it too well yeah and I think they like masculinize him a little bit too he's like this hard like yeah I can't have mm-hmm. a friend it can't be emotional yeah like they're very the opposite of toxic toxic masculinity when they're kids like the yeah. way they play is so like so lovingly. with abandon yeah. and just like I, yeah. like i mean and and this is probably my toxic masculinity coming to me it almost felt like almost romantic in a way i could see how you could read it as a man- yeah. romantic and i, could I don't see think it how was the, it wasn't yeah. and i could see yeah. how the story could you could rewrite the story and it could go that way, but yeah, well, yeah, I talked a, about how I this this has a brokeback mountain yeah. feel to me, where it's like, <laughs> but we used to be together, Copper. We can't do that anymore. I'm not like that. Like, yeah, but like, I also feel it. It shows that genuine love. It's like when yes. you're kids, you don't know you don't know any different, and you don't know that it's wrong and you don't see anything it's, wrong. It's with not it. wrong. Let's yeah. go out of the way. And no, say I'm it's sorry. Not wrong. I'm yes. not, I'm not <laughs> saying it is wrong, but I'm saying from their point of view, like they're being kids. Yes. Like, they, I think, I think well beyond just like, Hey, we should hang out together. And they don't know that they're not, that they're not supposed to be together because of Fox and Hound. I think it's, it's love. It's just completely just untethered love yes. for somebody. And it's something yeah. you see as a kid between boys and, and that sort of thing. And it's something that I think, toxic masculinity stomps out of you at a certain age yeah yeah i think you say that's not how boys interact and it's like well why not i think what you're seeing here which is interesting is it's a it's it's not like a a, a man a, a a woman and a man friend or two women friends where you have a, like for lack of a better term feminine energy this is a completely masculine friendship of masculine non-romantic love but they're expressing it in a way that i don't think that type of thing was expressed in that way to this day i think we're just starting to see stories about that i i've I've been a big proponent of it like there is this is one thing it's funny so a lot of people do you know what shipping is no so it's when you say people are in a relationship in fiction that they aren't so the one i'm thinking of is a lot of people ship captain america and the Winter Soldier. Oh, I see what you mean. Okay. And, and so a lot of people are like, oh, they're clearly gay. And I'm like, they're not gay. And it kind of upsets me when people say they're gay. It's okay if they were. I'm not saying that. But to me, I think the problem is... is You I think, want them to have a loving I want friendship. them to be completely in love with each other, non-sexually, non-romantically. Just yeah. like, I, you are my best friend and I care, and I care about, about you so about you. much. Yeah. And I think it's almost an issue, the, the idea of like, those two men love each other. Like, oh, they must be gay. That's a form of toxic masculinity to me. That's othering that relationship they have. And assuming because, when someone because, says that and assuming not, because of the way they're acting towards one another it has to be put in a box. Yes, right? but it's also yeah. I think when those people say that, those aren't any no one goes, Oh, they're gay. But the people who put who say it that way tend to not be like, and I love gay people. <laughs> like it's yes. people who are like, Oh, they must be gay because yeah. they're two men who are like physically affectionate Mm -hmm. but anyway that's that's my weird soapbox so we'll skip that the next question is how was the prince and i think we cover that they're kind of a prince prince Mm -hmm. princess relationship uh how was the sidekick so let's talk a little bit about um the widow tweed Uh, ellie yes ellie uh, um, and how much you guys loved her which she was fantastic we talked a little bit about how you were upset like with how she was treated I was upset with how she was treated, but I do like how she was also written strong. Oh, yeah, yeah, They wrote the other characters to mistreat her quite a bit, but they did write her, I think, pretty independent in a world where they don't necessarily write independent women Mm -hmm, characters mm -hmm. at this point in time. So I did appreciate that, and I did appreciate a lot about her. I just also was standing up for her. Yes. I feel like, but I did want to make sure that we just talked about like how good she was. Cause she yes. was good. Not just like this woman was treated poorly. She's fantastic. Yeah. Um, mama, big mama. I liked big mama. 
Did you not like her? Yeah, I think there's... We talk about racial... Um, I was going to bring this up, but I didn't know how to bring it up because I, I don't know how to put a word with it. I, it's I don't either. similar to Dumbo, right? It's not nearly it's not as Dumbo, bad as Dumbo, but, but it's like... Like the crows. It's like Bagger Vance. She's not magical, but it is like, I'm, I'm going to watch this whole thing and... And just talk about it and be kind of the one who sets things up. And there's, it feels a little tropey to do that to the only uh, actor of color. Yes. So I don't know if someone on the Facebook page has a better like grasp of that thought, or if I'm, or if I'm just full of. Let me I, know. Li- I liked her character, but I will say I had moments where I was flashing back to our conversation in Dumbo again. Not saying that it is similar to the crows because the crows go further with that but i had that moment a couple times with her but i would say overall we need it kind of that narrator that person that connects all the characters together and so for the storyline i think she was important yes yeah um dinky and i liked them i mean i guess because one of them had a east coast accent so i love i love an east coast accent so that's part of it uh what what was y'all's favorite musical number i anything with the uh fiddle there was some good fiddle i like the song when we're the best of friends when i listen to the lyrics it's heavier than i initially remember it but as soon as that melody came on i could hum the whole melody and it was Mm. one of those songs where i forgot i knew it as well as i did gretchen did you the same one yeah, I remember crying to that song when I was a kid and just being oh, like, oh, this great. is so warm fuzzies. <laughs> yeah, and that is like, I think that's the most full joy warm fuzzies part of the film is that scene for sure. That's when they're playing and loving on each other and mm-hmm. everything we were talking about earlier. Um, does it hold up? So let's talk about those things. Uh, drinking, smoking. I don't think there was any. The there only, was none of that. The you, only smoke was the uh, the, fu- the fire forest fire he started. He started yeah. And you made a joke that he would probably leave cigarette butts in yeah. the forest. But we <laughs> yeah. never see him probably. smoke. Yeah. But he would if he did. I'm shocked that character didn't smoke cigarettes. <laughs> um, guns and firearms. Shotgun all day, all, 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 yeah, all day, all night. Ethnic representation, like... I think it was, uh, so this is something we haven't really talked about, we probably should, is while they didn't have, like, getting away with not having, we're now in the 80s, getting away with not having racial, it's never cool, but getting away with not having racial stereotypes doesn't make you like, you did it, thumbs up. There's also, I think we need to talk about ethnic underrepresentation, yeah, which and is something inclusion. that has happened a lot in yeah. these movies. Um, and, and I'd really like for someone, if they can help me kind of help us kind of verbalize that our thoughts on Big Mama, that'd be great. I thought she was she it was yeah. a good acting job. I like the character, but there, there something feels a little fishy. I don't know if that's the word I'm looking for, but something something feels a little it feels off a little there. Off. Yeah. And I want to yeah. make sure that I'm yeah. not like, this and is I a great think- thing. And it's like, this is a trope we should. Yeah. Moving away from. And I think Amos was more a curm- curmudgeon than he was hillbilly. Because I think you can fall into that trope too, right? Where it's like you just <laughs> That's paint not somebody. an ethnicity. You no. defend ah! hillbilly so much on this show. I'm not. The reason why is because I read something specific about Appalachian music and about how oh, people, yeah, 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 right. people who have created that type of music, there's a lot of stereotypes behind those people that live in those areas. That's not true about them. But they're yeah. portrayed very negatively. I realize it's not an ethnicity, but I think it's still a trope. <laughs> Yes. And it's still a stereotype that I think is important to mention. And I know that's me mentioning it's, I guess, quote unquote, it, I, I think it's more than a white stereotype because there were people of color living in those areas playing that music as well that were also stereotyped in that way, even though it's predominantly right. a more white culture. But I just like to bring that up because I, for me, that's something I never thought about till I started reading that, that like Kill Billy is kind of a trope and like I think people dismiss it a lot and I don't know I just think maybe maybe it's because I just read about it that it was interesting to me to think about maybe it's because you married someone from a from a far-reaching white trash no family. no it more oh. has to do with the side of the Appalachian music and, yeah. and thinking more about bluegrass and stuff like that where do you think this took place because this didn't feel like Appalachia to me it felt more no. like the Rockies or like like Wyoming, like man, like kind of north, like because it got cold and it snowed. Well, I feel like it could also be, I mean, West Virginia. Yeah. Mm, okay, okay. I was more thinking like a West Virginia that's not, area. That's Appalachia. And it might be Appalachia. Yeah, I, I don't remember. if Do the Appalachia mountains, mountains go through West Virginia? I'm so glad that we're having this Appalachia talk with Gretchen on so we can yeah. sing uh, 
Take What's, Me Home Country Roads. Take Me Home Country Roads. So <laughs> like Rocky Top. Oh, Rocky Top. Yeah, that's yeah. Tennessee, though. Um, but yeah, no, do the. It's up in Tennessee. It's not. Do the. <laughs> do you know, Gretchen, if the Appalachian Mountains go through West Virginia? Uh, I think it's like just the Blue Ridge that cut down through. Yeah, Virginia I don't know that they do, but I but I like, feel uh, it like more like West Virginia than I feel. Maybe. Because West yeah. Virginia gets, there are parts of it that gets cold and gets like a good amount of snow. Yeah. West Virginia feels right. The other thing we need to talk about is is uh, female character agency, which I, th- in in my opinion, and let let me as the man go first. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> sorry. I'm the biggest. Let me roll that. out the red carpet for you. <laughs> oh, <geez. laughs> um, I think her agency was good, but the general attitude, and I oh, know the he was the heel. Of women, yes, yeah, yeah I, I know he was great. the heel, but it's it's like you can't do certain things. It's more creative to find good ways to well, make someone Well, even Todd, heel. when Todd insults Vixie, he uses female yes. so in it's a derogatory that, kind yeah. of negative yeah. way. It's weird that that happens so much in this movie where uh, the widow t- Tweed was Ellie. so was so I like good. how you're I like how you're like the hill you're willing to die on is to call I'm her an by originalist her <laughs> and I believe this is the intention of the of Frank we and Ollie the on their way to out to the girl in um the oh, what horse did we give? the the headless horseman right oh what was her name Margaret was that her <laughs> the, was that the her the one in the green the dress the woman who didn't no one want to dance with her yeah we gave her a name and you referred to her by her name why won't you refer to ellie by her one true name ellie <laughs> T- eleanor tweed yeah. let's move on um uh, <laughs> gretchen are you familiar with our uh villain ranking system no okay listeners we're gonna explain this whole system to gretchen and we will be right back Listeners, we are back. I have explained the infallible scientific villain ranking to Gretchen, and we are ready to get going. So Amos Slade, we have decided, is the bad guy in this. Um, I think you'd have a harder time arguing he wasn't the bad guy, but that's fine. Uh, let's start with Frightening. Uh, Gretchen, what do you think? Or let's start with T- We'll do a few first so you can kind of get an idea how we rank things. But Tara, what do you, what do you think? I'm debating between a three and a four. You think he's a four? I don't know that he's a solid four, but I he's do a soft think there. Four. Yeah, I do think there are moments where, like, I mean, he's got a he's gun. He's got guns. He no, I'm with you there. He shoots at Ellie. Like he shoots at Ellie. Granted, she doesn't pay no mind to him, but he shoots at her. He shoots at. He don't Todd. pay no mind. <laughs> he. She don't. Yeah, she doesn't. Sorry. Excuse me. Um, but I think I'm gonna give him a three because I think he's a solid three. I don't know that he makes it to a four, but I do think. He's a threat, and I think he's unstable. Like, I think, yeah. like, it's a danger to live next to him. So. I I think some of his frightening is is tempered by the fact that his pants keep falling down. <laughs> um. <laughs> yeah, that could be true. That could be very true. Um, so, yeah, I don't think he makes it to a solid four, so I'm going to give him a three. What do you think, Gretchen? I'm going to give him a three, too, but not necessarily his frightening. Like, he sucks at shooting. He shoots at Ellie forever. He shoots at Todd dozens of times in the movie. He never gets him. Like, he's just really not good at that, Mm -hmm. at least on camera. And he is more frightening in, like, the I might actually kill my neighbor sense. Mm, Like, yeah. And barging in in the middle of the night. Yeah. If I were Ellie, I would be scared, but not because he has a gun necessarily. Good point. Funny. You didn't give your rating for frightening. Oh, I three. Uh, do you want to go with funny first? Me? Yeah. Uh, I think I'm going to give him a two because I think, I think it's a hard two, but I think like the parts where his pants fall down, like I found the, like, I like, w- there's a part where he starts getting mad and he turns red and I don't mean like darker, like red. And I thought that was kind of, of humorous. Like, I think he's supposed to be funny in parts like at the end where he's like, because I think he's the butt of the joke at the end of the day. At the end of the day, even though he is frightening and stuff, he is like, Consign it, woman, let my foot go. And he's kind of Yosemite Sam esque. I think that's maybe why I liked him as I yeah, thought of him. I'm going to give him a Sammy. one because I didn't laugh at the end. I was outraged. Well, because I'm just thinking, okay. So I was just thinking, when did I laugh at him? And I didn't. And when you were giving the example of how you thought he was funny at the end, I was outraged that Ellie was taking care of him at the end. So I was not even paying attention to what he was okay. saying. So for me, it's a one because. 
I didn't find him funny and I think I was so focused on how negative he was towards her that I had a hard time seeing past that. Gretchen? So. Yeah, I give him a one too and I totally yeah. agree with Tara. I was outraged. Yeah, Gretchen and I were shouting at the screen when that came on. Like, what is she doing? <laughs> okay, fierce. A one. Okay. Same. Same. I think I'm going to do this. I, I, I think, I, yeah, I think what I like about him fits more under design than I fierceness. Think so too, I think yes. he... Fierce, uh, fierceness also is a degree of having your. We're gonna have to bleep this out. Fierceness is also a degree of having your <laughs> together. And I think I it's think... also having authority. I don't think he yes. ever has. Yeah, no. that's a better way to say what you just it's, said. It's, <laughs> well, um, okay. I think, but he it's loses ha- his pants. He yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like, so that's why he gets a one to me. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, like he doesn't have authority. He's not commanding. Like when I think fierce, I think. Think of Maleficent in that scene where she casts that curse. Like, she has authority and attention yes. of the room. I like his look, but that'll come under design. So let's yeah. talk about effective. He, he's a good trapper, but he sucks at getting Todd. So I think I'm going to give him a two. Yeah, I think I'm going to give him a two because we see all those pelts and furs, but we never actually see him get any of those. He just That could be all them. copper and Right? Yes. Yeah, so I'm going to give him a two cause, because even at the end of the day, I was going to say he trained copper, but really Chief trains copper. Yeah. So I got to say, you're you're talking me down to a one. Yeah, I give him a one because he's not effective. Like, his whole goal of this entire movie is to get Todd and he sucks and he doesn't do it over yeah. and over again. I, yeah. I'm going to give him a one. I, he, I getting getting pelts is not part so. of his evil plan. Yeah. yeah. So you say that again, Gretchen? And I think I was trying to give you... Uh, Don't do so, that. Don't no, I think I was trying anything. to... What I'm saying is I think I was trying to give you support for a two and then I think I also talked myself to a one as I was listening <laughs> yeah. to what I was saying. That's what I wanted to say is I feel like I talked myself into what it should be. Okay, design. Gretchen, do you want to go first in design? That's his look. That's... Yeah, I think he he fits his character well. Like, probably. I mean, well, I mean, like, look. Does he you, like you, like it's visual design? First, then, okay, I'm gonna give him a four. Like. Okay. Because I love hillbillies, like you said. I think he he looks. He's got. I love his hat. I love. I want to know what hat that is. I've never seen a hat like that in real life that looks good where it like just flips up in the front. Mm. He's got a mustache. I think he's our first must, you know, he's got a mustache. No, that's not villain. true. Is that, but, he's our, no, he's not our first mustache. That can't villain. be true. The opera guy. Yeah, exactly who I was thinking yeah. of. But this is the kind of mustache I like. This is his thick. A full. Oh, so good. Tom Selleck um, type of a mustache. Oh, yeah. This is exactly. <laughs> and he also has the jacket. That looks like the Bane jacket from Dark Knight Rises. Like, mm. it's big shoulders. Like, I love it. I, I like his look. It's right up my alley. I can understand if you don't agree because I'm probably looking for something more specific out of this character than maybe you, fi- you either of you find enjoyable. Mm. But I give him a four. I was going to give him a three. I I think, he, you know, he's a good hillbilly. They did a good job. I like those elements you mentioned. I don't love him nearly as much as you do, so it makes me feel like I should give him a two. <laughs> Because you're significantly more in love with this character than I am. I, 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 he's you a, really like his design. I will yeah. say. I think if he didn't say female like he did, we would have liked him <laughs> a lot better. Yeah. Well, no, he also does a lot of bad conservationist stuff. I don't know. Yeah. I, I like I'm a good gonna, bad guy. I'm going to give him a two. Okay. On design. You also had a strong jaw. You know how I feel about jaws. Yeah. No, <laughs> I agree with your points, but for me, I just don't feel feel that way so that's fine that's two. absolutely fine um i'm gonna go ahead and mark you both down for five for go away heat yes yeah <laughs> is that true Get yeah. out. Get it's a hundred percent true and the thing is is i think i said it earlier is in the beginning i could take him a little bit like i didn't like how he treated the dogs in the beginning he tied them up and kept them outside and like was was kind of curmudgeon but curmudgeon was a good descriptor of him in the mm-hmm. beginning but then he gets to a point where i don't want to see him on screen i don't care for how he's behaving i think uh, for me it was the last straw when he started the fire i think which is towards the end of the movie but when he yeah, started the fire yeah i did make it pretty far i mean and i'm not saying i loved him up until that point but i think i was okay that he was a part of the film right like no but when he came home with copper in a bag that was that's it. true yeah like, for gretchen gretchen here. was gretchen was out from like 10 minutes into the film get he out. hasn't even yeah. spoken before you <laughs> yeah. see that even hey and i don't disagree i can understand why you feel strongly that way 
And I think for me, there's a lot of moments that I'm like, I don't like that he did this. But yeah, he gets a five go away heat. So Ryan, now that you have these two strong females shouting at you, what what is your you thought? Feel? I thought he was a three. I mean, he didn't bother me nearly as much as you guys. I, I but I I will say so. What's your yes factor? Two ones. Oh yeah, I wasn't excited yeah, to ever no. see him a one. Okay, I'm gonna give him a two simply because I wanted him on screen because I could hear you two yell at him. <laughs> So he's going to get a two for that reason. Um, oh, and I take it back with the fire. The minute I lost is when he barges into her house. That did actually, oh, yeah. I really yeah. was uncomfortable with that. That's where I feel like he crossed a line. I mean, he crosses yeah. lines throughout it, but. All right. So what's his number? Uh, give me a six. So he's a little higher than you think. He- oh, oh. Where so he here's the deal. Here's the deal. We now have, so. Lump jaws in this group, but I think part of it is just because of where he is. But we he has now become a part of the... F- oh, no. Mr. Winky's 14. But he is in a tie with the with another one of the highest go-away heat characters we have. And that is Donald Duck's libido. <laughs> from the Three Caballeros. Uh, I will say I felt... I felt similar feelings of, like, not wanting Donald's libido on the screen as I did for him. So that makes sense. It is now a four-way tie for 26th. Out of how many so far? uh, Out of 35. Okay. Wow. So it's a four-way tie between Stromboli, (laughs) uh, Lump Jaw from Fun and Fancy Free, and Donald Duck's libido with Amos Slade from The Fox and the Hound. And Stromboli is Pinocchio. Yes. Yeah. Does this get a clamshell special edition on your shelf or are we going to lock it away in the vault? No, I still have the VHS of this in my house, my parents' house. I won't let them get rid of this one. So yeah. Tara seems conflicted. I'm conflicted because Which I... means it's, it should go in the vault, but she no, doesn't no, no, want to no, put no. anything in the but vault. I think other than be... Peter Pan and Pete's Dragon. I think you're going to be surprised. <laughs> yeah, we didn't say Pete's Dragon, but Pete's Dragon is in the vault. <laughs> like, there's snow getting around that. Um I'm conflicted because I do think I like the theme of the friendship and I do think there's a lot. I'm not a parent. I do think there's a lot that you could talk about in this film that you could approach subjects in a not as heavy way. I do think there's a scary and a lot of intense stuff in this film for sure. But I do think it would bring about a lot of conversations. Do I think it's worth it that you have your kids watch it for that? I don't know because I don't have kids. I would love to hear from parents because I do think there's a lot of good lessons in this. Even the way that females are treated, I think it's an example to be like, that's not how you Mm -hmm. talk to... Like, it's good examples of like, you shouldn't allow someone to talk to you that way. Right, because I think that's a good thing for kids to go, look how much better she is than than he gives her credit for. Yeah. He's obviously the bad guy. Yeah, and And I think think also from that point of view too, saying, look, she, she stood up for herself in that moment and that's what you need to do if somebody talks to you that way. You need to stand up for yourself. And shoot the radiator. Yes. (laughs) So, yes. Don't let him get away with it. Awesome. Um, But no, so you know what I mean? And I do, it's hard because it's almost two movies in one way. Like that beginning with the warm and fuzzies and the friendship and I think the things that are nostalgic for Gretchen, like I think there's a lot of like sweet moments there. And then I think there's a lot in the second half that can be talked about to bring about other conversations, right? Mm -hmm. So that's kind of why I'm conflicted. Yeah, you can't put this on and just walk away from your kids with this one. I would agree with that. Absolutely. I think you need to watch it with older kids. Not not like 17. Yeah, but not (laughs) not three and four years old. Like, like, yeah, I think we're talking like 10. Yeah, maybe even a little older depending on, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. again, you know your kids. Yeah, but but yeah, yeah, it's not something you just put on. I also, I I will say going into this, I'll be honest, I was a little nervous that I was going to like, I I thought I was going to not like it. Um, Because I, like I said, I don't remember, didn't remember much from it. Um, I, I don't know if I'd watch it again anytime soon. But I'm glad I watched it. And I think it goes up on the shelf for me. Yeah. And I think that's that's why for me, I was conflicted not saying I wanted it in the vault. But I think it's more than just do I like it or not as to why it should be on the shelf, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So I think there's more. I think, as we said earlier, there's more depth to it. Um, Well, Gretchen, thank you so much for doing this with us. Um, We ask our 
uh, our guests, to, if they want to plug something at the end, it can be a personal project. It can be some thing you've enjoyed recently that's not associated with you. It can just be peace on earth and goodwill towards men or, or, or whatever you want. It can be absolutely anything. Um, anything you'd like to plug? Yeah. Wear a mask and stay home. Yes, Gretchen. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and well, if you're in the Spokane area and need a dog sitter... Or get a hold of us and we'll, we'll connect get you. Get a hold of us and we'll connect We're you with them. Gretchen because she's an expert. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, thank you so much for doing this. We really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me. It was a lot of fun. Um, and guys, next uh, next week or next full episode, we will be doing, and I'm very excited uh, to force Tara to watch this, Tron. <laughs> <laughs> I've never seen it, so it's going to be an adventure. Yep, should be good. Thanks, guys. All right, thanks, Gretchen. Thanks for listening to Tara and Ryan's Princess Diaries. If you want to tell us your favorite Disney villain and why it's guest on, send us an email at trprincessdiaries at gmail.com. Or you can send a tweet about how great Maleficent is to at TRP Diaries. Check out our Facebook group by searching for Tara and Ryan's Princess Diaries. Tara and Ryan's Princess Diaries are available on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, Overcast, and many more. Wherever you hear us, please be our knight in shining armor and give us a five-star review. Thanks again, and until next time, remember to always live happily ever after.